from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Om Namah Shri Yati Rajaya Vivekananda Surai Sajjit Sukhaswarupaya Swami Neta Baharine. Salutations to Swami Vivekananda. Today, welcome to this very auspicious uh, Day, we are celebrating the 158th birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda. Especially here, it's being celebrated around the world, um, but here especially, this center, we have the proud heritage of uh, having been founded by Swami Vivekananda himself. Uh, this was the first Vedanta Society. After he came to the West in 1893, the World Parliament of Religions, and then New Yorkers, always enterprising, they grabbed him first. And they said, you come to our city and you start uh, something. So that was the first Vedanta Society, 1894. If you look outside, it says Vedanta Society of New York, founded in 1894. I often see people walking past, looking at it casually, then stopping and look, coming back and taking a look again. 1894, so many years ago. Um, in this talk, what I shall do is, Swami Vivekananda gave a talk, The Real and the Apparent Man. And he gave this talk in New York, in the Vedanta Society. Not in this building, because this building we got 100 years ago in 1920. But before that it was in different rented locations. So this was a talk given in New York. And we shall reflect upon what he said in this talk. This talk is included in Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga. Swami Vivekananda said later on, that he always intended to write a book on Advaita Vedanta. He never did it. it. He never had the time to do it. But the closest we have are these collection of talks, lectures on Jnana Yoga, the way of knowledge. They're collected in one book. So the real and the apparent man, the very powerful talk he gave here. In this talk, Swami Vivekananda answers that the greatest of all questions. Who are we and what is our destiny? What is human destiny? What's going to become of us? What are we? What's our nature? And um, he brings together, he says, I shall attempt to present here the thought of ancient India. Basically, three streams of thought. Uh, three very broad philosophical I won't say three philosophies because there are more than one philosophy in each one of these streams of thought. So three broad philosophical currents he presents. Remarkable performance in, in one talk. The entirety of dualism, dvaita, various kinds of dualistic philosophies. And we'll see very soon what it, what it means. What does dualism mean actually? And then the opposing current in the form of opposing to dualism. In the form of Buddhism. He presents that too. And finally, works out a harmony in non-dualism, in Advaita. So, dualistic philosophy, Dvaita, and Buddhistic philosophy, each of these, in, uh, you can say there are a bunch of schools of philosophies, actually. And then finally, non-dualism. So, he starts off, actually he starts off by a quick survey on an ancient Indian cosmology. What is this physical universe? And I will not go into it, just very briefly. He says that uh, the idea was all of this material, the material universe, has come from one primordial material called Akasha. Literally translates into space. And all forces are resolved back into one primordial fo force called Prana. So all force, energy in this, in this universe is a product of that Prana. And all the matter that we see in this universe is a product of that primordial Akasha. Prana works on Akasha, produces this entire universe. Now, it, it's not as primitive as it might sound. 
because if you look at the most modern theories of cosmology, I will not enter into that, we're just touching upon it. I was just reading that the latest ideas of the origin of the universe are talking about something called a quantum flux, where there is an emptiness, a nothingness, a void, but a mass of potential particles are there which pop into existence and disappear immediately in tiny fractions of, uh, of a second. Uh, from unmanifest state into a manifestation and back again into an unmanifest state until the Big Bang comes and the universe is, uh, this physical universe is produced. I think that if you got one of these ancient philosophers like Kapila, for example, who is at the source of the ancient Sankhya philosophy, Swami Vivekananda calls him the first philosopher of humanity more than 5,000 years ago. And if you were to educate him in quantum mechanics and tell him about the quantum flux, he would be quite happy. He would be pleased with it. I mean, in principle, it's, it's not different. I am not at all claiming, not making exaggerated claims about the ancients knew about quantum mechanics. and Not at all. That's silly. They didn't have the benefit of our modern physics or mathematics. But in principle, you see, that there was a primordial material um, from which evolves everything else. And Swami Vivekananda says, beyond both Akash and Prana, the, he, he goes to Sankhya philosophy and says there is this cosmic mind, Mahat. From them, all this has emerged. But back to ourselves. What are we? And Swami Vivekananda starts his talk with an epistemological investigation. How do we see anything? How do we experience anything? So light comes from outside and then it enters into our eyes, into our optic nerves. Uh, it's so when, there are objects outside here, so many things. But when it comes to our eyes, it's no longer objects. The paper or the clock or the person does not enter into my eye. That would be terrible. It's just reflected light which comes. From all objects, just light comes to the eyes. The eyes gather in light. And from there, it doesn't remain light. Very soon it became, becomes an image uh, in the lens in the, of the eye. And after that, immediately after that, it becomes a burst, a tiny, tiny burst of electricity in our optic nerves. Uh, and that's, that impulse is transmitted down uh, to the brain. And in the brain center, somehow, even here with all our latest science, it ends there. What is happening in the brain center, that's the last thing that we can see in science. Nothing more. That's it. But our experience does not end there. We experience everything in the mind. In the, it becomes an, uh, a thought in the mind, a perception in the mind. And from the mind, uh, Swami Vivekananda uses manas, manas which collates all information. Manas is the Sanskrit term for mind. It collects information not only from the eyes, but also the ears and the sense of touch and smell and taste. And then uh, it presents it to the buddhi, the intellect. So these are fine divisions of the mind. The intellect now matches it with past experience, which is collected in the form of you know, the hard drive, the chitta, the storehouse of past impressions. So memory comes up and it's, it's matched with that. And then Vivekananda says, these ancient philosophers, they said something more is necessary. The world is a mass of change. Body is continuously changing. The sense organs are dynamic and functioning. And the mind is also continuously changing. So is the buddhi. But ultimately on the background there must be an unchanging unity of perception. It's almost the language of Kant, Immanuel Kant. An unchanging unity of apperception must be there. On which... All of this is thrown and from which a reaction comes and that is knowledge. All of this, it takes so much time to say. All we see is, I see you. That's it. <laughs> so a knowledge comes, flash of knowledge comes. There is this background, an unchanging background. And Swami Vivekananda, he uses an example. Um, his talk is full of metaphors and similes, and very rich in examples, in metaphors, similes. In fact, at one point, I started counting, and I counted 16 different types of examples which he has used. One of them he uses at this point, the camera. And that was high-tech at that time. Uh, you had to go to a studio and a camera. It, it was a big deal, not a selfie, not like today. They would, they would, you had to stand in front of a background, and the camera is there, which is a big, uh, looks like a modern science fiction ray gun or something like that. And the man will come, he'll throw a black coat over himself, and, and so on. 
He says, look at the camera. There's the light and the lens and so many things. But ultimately there is a, an unchanging background on which everything is thrown. The light is thrown, the image is thrown and it is captured there. So that unchanging background is necessary to give unity to our perception. That I see, there is, I am one being who sees and hears and smells and tastes and touches and remembers and understands and thinks and feels and desires and hates. All of this united in one background which we call the self. Clearly, this is an unchanging background. Otherwise, you see, to make sense of all the changes, there must be something which is unchanging with respect to the changing body and mind. So the self cannot be the body, the self cannot be the changing mind, the self must be this unchanging background which the ancients called Atman, the self. So this Atman theory, I will not say theory, it will say theories. There are multiple theories which emerged. But the basic model was this. There is of course the world, but here is the body, the living body. And beyond subtler than the body, inner to the body, is what is called the subtle body, sukshma sharira, subtle body. Nothing peculiar in this. The subtle body we experience also right now. When you feel emotions, when we experience things, when we think and remember, all of this is the subtle body. And so why isn't it the physical body? Where does the physical body end? Even the most sophisticated instruments at our disposal will end with the functioning of the brain and the nervous system. None of them will reveal to you love or hate or understanding or uh, memory or forgetfulness. Yes, they will reveal what are called the neural correlates of these things. The activities in the brain and... Uh, but it's not exactly the same thing. When you um, taste a cup of tea or coffee, the warmth and the texture and the fragrance and the taste that you feel, you feel that. You don't feel a burst of electricity. Nobody does that. When you see, you see color, you see red. You don't see a burst of electricity. The scientist is seeing the burst of electricity and you are experiencing the first person experience which are called qualia. What is the connection between these? That is the cutting edge of thought in modern consciousness studies. That's called the hard problem of consciousness. And I can see people rolling their eyes. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> One of my favorite subjects, but I'm not going to go into that. So, ultimately there must be something beyond the physical body. And that the ancients called the subtle body, which we all experience all the time. But something beyond the changing subtle body also, which these uh, dualistic schools call the self, the Atman. So self is our real nature. We are actually not this physical body because the self existed before we had a physical body. And the self exists, the Atman exists now that we have a physical body. But one day the physical body will die and the self continues to exist. Um, I will not go into the arguments, but it's not very difficult to see why they would have thought that. Because when death comes, what is the empirical evidence? The empirical evidence is here was a living body, now it's a dead body. Nobody has the evidence that the self, the Atman, is dead. How do you know? It's only the person who was getting the first person experience within, that person is qualified to say yes or no. But if the person says, yes, I am dead, that means he's not dead. <laughs> we cannot contact that person because the means of contact have been uh, are dead now because the body is dead. So the ancients evolved this idea, if the self cannot die, the subtle body also does not die. The sukshma sharira, thoughts, feelings, emotions, our past experiences, some scars they are called. And these ones, the Atman gathers to itself the subtle body, physical body is dead, Atman gathers to itself the subtle body and leaves the inhabitable dead body. The body cannot be used anymore, it goes. Why does it go? Where does it go? Why does it have these experiences? So the great theory of karma. So why should I believe in karma? Karma is nothing but cause and effect. And everybody believes in cause and effect. Entirety of science is cause and effect. What we call common sense is causality. There are causes and there are consequences. Actions and consequences, causes and effects. Everybody knows this. And even a child, even the, the more intelligent of the animals, they have a sense of causality. If I do this, that will happen. So causality 
That applied to our personal life is the law of karma. So this is something that the ancient Indians believed in, irrespective of schools. All the dualistic schools believed in it. All the Buddhist schools believed in it. All the Jaina schools believed in it. Um, so And the non-dualists also in, in their own special way. Karma is upon the departed soul. Now look at the words. They make sense. Departed soul. What has departed? Not the physical body. That's gone. Dead. Buried. Burnt. Whatever. The departed soul is the Atman plus the subtle body. It's the subtle body which departs from the physical body. And in the dualistic schools, the Atman also departs. Atman is something that comes and goes in the, in the old schools. Where does it go? Depends on karma. Each individual has his or her own karma. And uh, depending on that karma, that person has other experiences. What are the other experiences? So these dualistic schools spoke about three possibilities. So Swami Vivekananda is here just sort of summarizing the thought of these ancients. Three possibilities after death. One is that uh, those who were very spiritual, very devout, devout in what sense? There was also the idea of God. What is God? Among all these selves, the Atma, there are many Atmans. Among all these Atmans, there is one special Atman. One, we are all Atman, soul, separate self. But one special Atman, not only is it immortal like each of us, but it's also all powerful. It is the creator of the universe. It's basically the self or the soul of this physical universe. And they called it God. You see, it's a belief. Yes, it's a belief. They believed that there is, a, just like there is a soul in each body, there's a soul to this entire universe, and they called it God. The, it's, it was a, another kind of Atman, a special Atman, very powerful, unlike us. All-knowing, all-powerful, and the creator of this universe, benevolent, and so on. Um, so if the person is very devout to this God, and has li lived a very moral and ethical life, has enormous amounts of good karma, is enormous amounts of good karma. Then this person goes to what is called the what you might call the highest heaven. They had a name for it, Brahmaloka. That's the place where you feel where God dwells. This God of the universe, they call it Ishwara or Bhagavan. Or, that dwells in heaven, and they give different names to it. The Vedic name is Brahmaloka, but later on in the Puranic age, this became. Kailasha, Vaikuntha, and Devi Loka, and so on. So you go there, and you dwell in the presence of God. If, if that soul is um, very pure, has no further desires, then when the, this universe will come to an end, that soul gets moksha, liberation. And it does not have to come back to the cycle of births and deaths. Births and deaths. This, um, if there is any, any desire left, that person will again have to come back uh, again to this human form and work out karma. That's the first one. It's a very glorious destiny. So it's only reserved for very good, very spiritual people. Then the next level is those who are devout and good, but they're not, they have not reached that acme of spiritual perfection. So after death, they go to what is called Pitri Loka, the world of the uh, forefathers, the world of the ancestors. So there is a whole range of heavens. Take your pick. Actually, you can't take your pick. It depends on your karma, on, <laughs> on, your, on your credit, moral credit. So you are placed, you are placed in, the, in what, is, what, you, what we deserve. You go there. And these are very pleasant places to spend thousands of years until our good karma is worked out and our bad karma is upon us again and we tumble back into this world and we are reborn as a baby somewhere. Usually once you get a human birth, so all kinds of births are possible. Physical bodies are of all sorts, animals, birds, bees, human beings, everything. But once you get a human birth, you progress further and further. Generally do not. The third um, option is for the wicked. So if, you, if a person is particularly naughty, then you don't get to go to the highest heaven, of course not. Not even to the world of the forefathers. But the one is born as um, uh, animals and birds, uh, plants, uh, and work out the evil karma. Or even there are lower worlds. Uh, you were, you're born as devils and demons. And you work out the lower karma, bad karma through suffering, and you're back again into the human world. 
So this was their cosmology. Whose cosmology? The dualistic uh, schools in ancient India, among whom you can count the Nayaikas, the Vaisheshikas, the Sankhyans, the Yoga school. Um, Swami Vivekananda said that, note the glory of human destiny, the glory of human birth in this whole scheme. Believe in it or not, notice that it says, only in the human birth you can generate good karma. So you are all, you come, he says this human world was called karma bhumi, the world of karma. So here you come back and work out your salvation. What would be salvation? What would salvation be like? One gets freedom from this cycle of birth and death. You, the ever perfect self, the Atman, you are limited, constricted as it were, put in a straight jacket as it were. What is the straight jacket? There are two of them. One is the subtle body and one is the physical body. And shuttle from one lunatic asylum to the other. So this is what's happening to us. And freedom from this cycle of birth and death is the goal of life. So that you remain as the self, unrestricted. Uh, in fact, the uh, Kashmiri Shaivas, they talk about the physical bodies as Kanchukas, like shirts, which are tight. <laughs> um, a holy Mother says, once in her meditation, she felt entirely free of the physical body, and she soared into her real self. And then she said, when I felt a tug back into the body, and I did not want to come back to this dirty cage of flesh and bone. So it's like that. Um, and freedom from it is remaining in your real self. What is the nature of this Atman, this self? We know what is the nature of the body here. We know what's the nature of the subtle body. We know thoughts, feelings, emotions, like that. What's the nature of the Atman? Different theories. The Nyaya Vaisheshika school said it was like a substance, a dravya. Not conscious in itself, but when it comes into contact with the mind, you experience awareness and thoughts, feelings, emotions. The Sankhya school said, no, 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 the self is conscious. It is consciousness itself. Its very nature is consciousness, awareness. Only when you come into contact with the mind, this consciousness is reflected in the thoughts and feelings and you experience that awareness. It's like if light is there, but there's no object to reflect light, you would not be aware of light. Like deep space. Looks black and dark. But if a comet passes through it, you see a dazzling display of the tail of the comet. Right? Is the comet carrying its own uh, light? No. Uh, it's the sunlight which is streaming through the darkness of space. And when the comet passes through that sunlight, it shines. That means the light was there all along. Similarly, the Sankhyans say, you are of the nature of pure consciousness. And when you come into contact with the mind, then it lights up like the tail of the comet and you experience awareness. Anyway, these were different ideas. But the basic, uh, basic idea of the self was... We are an immortal being, not that nice saying, we are not, uh, we think we are human beings in search of spiritual experience, but the truth is we are spiritual beings having a human experience. The dualistic schools would entirely agree, that's what they wanted to say. We are spiritual beings, this Atman, in plural, each of us is a separate Atman. So far so good, very nice cosmology and you know, this is basically the idea be behind most religions. In Hinduism, the Vaishnava, Shakta, Shaiva idea, we are all Jiva, separate beings. And there is a God, you can call it Shiva or Shakti or uh, whatever you want to call it, Vishnu, whatever you want to call it. Same idea. Um, and we go through heavens and hells and earths and finally get liberation and re remain in, in heaven in the presence, highest heaven, Brahmaloka, in the presence of God. Same idea in Islam and Christianity and Judaism, everywhere. This is the dualistic idea. So far so good, but now comes the Buddhist, who is very skeptical about this whole picture. The Buddhist asks, where is this precious Atman of yours? Where is this great God of yours? We experience a changing body. Here's a body, changing, nobody doubts that. We experience the world and the body, which is a mass of change. We even experience the mind, which is a mass of change. Thoughts, feelings, emotions coming, rushing on and off, flickering in and out. 
But beyond this, why talk about um, an Atman? What are the arguments? Where do you know? Where, where is the proof of such a thing? That there is a body and a mind and an Atman, a third entity. Where is the proof of such a thing? No, no, there must be a unity, a changelessness behind all the change. Otherwise, how would you have? They attack. The Buddhists attack this. Why does it have to be a changeless entity? A relatively changeless entity can um, uh, serve as much, you know, like the mind is changing very fast. And related to that, there is a, another part of the mind which does not change so much. And that one can cognize this one. So there are a lot of arguments started. Tremendous philosophers came up. And they had this idea of not-self. Self-theory versus not-self-theory. Atma-theory versus anatma-theory. Great philosophers. Uh, about 500 years after the Buddha, um, Naga Arjuna, Vasubandhu, uh, um, Dignaga, Dharmakirti, Chandrakirti, Ratnakirti, one who wrote the um, Bodhicharya Avatara, Shantideva, Incredible. A great flowering of philosophy took place when the Buddhist philosophers attacked the dualistic Hindu schools, challenging them to prove the existence of this Atman. Because without Atman and without God, God and self, without soul and without God, the whole dualistic religion collapses. What's it for? What, what, what does it talk about? So this tremendous attack started. And the dualistic schools also produced great philosophers who fought back. And this fighting was, of course, highly intellectual. And they developed uh, metaphysical theories, developed, became more sophisticated. Logic developed. The art of debate developed. Langu linguistic theories developed. Uh, and so Indian philosophy saw a thousand year uh, of, you know, uh, blooming. So, so many texts, so many schools, so many theories and very sophisticated stuff, which is only now beginning to be reflected in modern thought. I mean, I spent uh, the last six months at Harvard studying these Buddhist schools. And uh, the professor would point out once in a while, look, this is what this, this uh, Buddhist philosopher, what Chandrakirti is saying. Now look at what Wittgenstein said in, uh, uh, in uh, Cambridge. In the, in the mid middle of the 20th century. Uh, what Russell says, what Wittgenstein says, what Sellers says, what Quine says in America, uh, separated by 1,000 years, 1,200 years, almost exactly the English translation of uh, what they were saying in Sanskrit 1,200 years ago. It's stunning to see. He says that there's very little that's truly new in philosophy. So they're just styles which, go, which come into style, fashion, and which go out of fashion. And you see the same ideas being reflected again. Swami Vivekananda in his talk, he said this. He says, a lot of what the Buddhists said is now sort of being recycled back as modern thought in the West. Uh, he said, it's, there's very little that's new here actually. Even this whole debate between idealists and realists, idealism and realism. Um, this was... Uh, an ancient debate between the Vijnanavadi Buddhists, the Yogacara Vijnanavada school of Buddhism versus the Nyaya uh, realists uh, and worked out in much more subtle, very carefully, intricately worked out details than even what modern philosophers are uh, trying to understand. So this was the Buddhist, the great Buddhist attack. They demonstrated um, that even without accepting an unchanging separate Atman, just if you take the mass of change as, as this body, body and mind, you can still explain memory, you can still explain perception, you can still even explain karma, birth and Buddhists accepted it, that you go through births and rebirths. If you ask who goes, if you don't exist and who is going through, they'll say a, a stream is going through this. When a wave travels in the ocean, it's not that the same wave is coming here. At the same, at each place, the water rises and falls. Uh, if you shake a rope, which is tied from this end to that end, you will see a wave will travel across the rope. It's not that one uh, entity is traveling from here to there unchangingly. It's just the wave is uh, the movement of the rope at each, each place. Similarly, there is a transmission. Not that there is an entity called Atma traveling from life to life. There is a transmission of forces. 
So at each moment it is different. Um, you are you thought that you came to the Vedanta Society and then you waited for the talk and you are listening to the talk. Not at all. The Buddhist will say, the one who came to the Vedanta Society is history. Gone. Finished. The one who sat down is gone. Finished. And you who are listening, you are also going away, getting finished very soon. <laughs> and each moment to moment, uh, a new entity is arising and disappearing. I don't know which one is more difficult to swallow. An inter eternal, permanent self or... Moment to moment arising and disappearing me. <laughs> worked out, let me give a little example of uh, how they worked it out. It's good to listen to these ancient philosophers. Vivekananda did not quote this, but I'm just introducing this. Chandrakirti, who lived around 600 uh, CE, 680, 1400 years ago. Um, he says he wants to prove that there is no self, no Atman. How does he do it? He says he uses uh, his famous example of the chariot. Today he would have used an SUV or something, but anyway, chariot will do. It's, so the example, if you Google, it's a famous thing. The Chandrakirti's chariot, if you Google. So he has introduced what is called a sevenfold reasoning. What is the example? First, we must understand. Chandrakirti says, quite stunningly, there is no such thing as a chariot. What do you mean? There it is. You came on a chariot yourself. <laughs> where is the, what is this then? He said, no, let us examine. Where is this chariot? The, and we, I will show that there is no such thing as a self, Atma. All right, how? Sevenfold reasoning. Very quickly, I'll run through it. Not very difficult. First, the chariot is not the same as its parts. The wheels and the axle and the, the nave of the chariot and the platform... That's not the chariot. Uh, if you take the parts separately, is it the chariot? No. Uh, the parts themselves are not the chariot. The wheel is a wheel, it's not a chariot. Um, similarly, the body-mind is not the self. And here Vedanta agrees. All the, the uh, arguments that I have often shared with you to show why the body-mind is not the self. Same things Chandrakirti says. 300, 200 years, 300 years before Shankaracharya. Why is the body-mind not the self? Because it's an object and you are the experiencer of that object. Because it is changing and you admit yourself that I, the self, am unchanging. I was the same self, the same I was in the baby body, in the child's body, in the teenager's body, in the middle-aged person's body. Body is changing so much. The, then how can I be the body? If I am unchanging and the body is changing, I cannot, changing, unchanging cannot be the same thing. The, uh, the, Body and mind are made of, are composite, are made of so many parts. Organs, you know, tissues and cells and um, so much of stuff is there. And thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas. Which one of those parts am I? None. They are a complex. I always think of myself as a unit. I don't think of myself as a committee. So I am unit, identity, one. And the body is many. So these arguments Chandrakirti gives to show that what you consider to, the, to be the self, the Atman, it can't be the body, which is an object, which is changing, which is composite. Because you admit yourself, the self is not changing, the self is the subject, self is one. So the self cannot be the body, just as the chariot is not the parts. One. Two. The chariot is nothing apart from the parts. Is there a chariot apart from the parts? If you say, there is no space for uh, all the parts here, just keep the parts aside, but you can park your chariot in, uh, in front of the... <laughs> that can't be done. There is no chariot apart from the uh, parts. The parts are not the chariot, and yet there is no chariot apart from the parts. Similarly, um, is there a self apart from the body and mind? That's what you are claiming. See, this is the crucial claim of the dualistic schools. Where? Prove it. Every argument that the dualistic schools give to show a separate self is necessary, the Buddhists counter by giving arguments to show that whatever reason you are giving, memory, going from life to birth to life, and the karma, the unity of per perception, all of these can be explained without a separate self. They can be explained with the use of the mind itself, body-mind itself. Second, the chariot is not apart from the parts, and the body and the self is not apart from body and mind. There's no self. You can't demonstrate. Third, 
is the chariot, is it the possessor of the parts? You might say, look, you are just playing with words. I am not saying that I am the um, hand or the belly. Or I am not saying that I am something separate, another entity apart from this. I am saying I am the owner of this body. It is my body. Chandrakirti says, is that so? Is the chariot the owner of the parts? Is there such an owner? Is the chariot such an owner which says these are my parts? There is no such thing which owns the parts. Similarly, there is where is this entity which owns the body? I own it. But that is the body which is saying it. And behind it, it is the mind which is saying it. Apart from that, where is this owner? Owner. There is no chariot which is the owner of the parts. Fourth, there is no chariot which is the container of the parts. That means... Is the chariot something like a basket in which all the parts are put? Is the chariot a thing in which the parts have been kept? No. There is no such chariot. Similarly, the self is not something in which the body-mind has been kept. Self is a container which has the body-mind, like a basket with flowers in it. So are you the Atma in which there is body-mind and thoughts and feelings? No, there is no such thing. You can't demonstrate. That's the fourth one. Fifth one, the opposite. The parts are not a container in which the chariot is there. Are the parts like a basket in which you have put a chariot? Keep the parts and then can you find there is something called the chariot in the parts? No. The body mind, the Buddhists call it the skandhas, the five skandhas, pancha skandha. The body mind aggregate, they use the word, English translation is aggregate. The body mind aggregate is not like a basket in which the self has been put. So the parts, the self does not contain the uh, body-mind, the body-mind does not contain the self. Is the body-mind like a basket in which the self is put? It's like, I'm, what I'm asking is, here is the body-mind in which you can find a liver or a kidney. Can you find a self? Is it taught in physiology class? Here is the, body, here is the liver and kidney and all of that. And then there is one more self located just between the two kidneys or something like that. No. You can't find that. When we say that it is in the atma, in the heart, and well, which which cardiologist will say I've discovered the self? <laughs> you know, with open heart surgery, you have to be careful not to touch the self. You have to cut the heart. Don't cut the self. <laughs> no, it is not an entity contained in the body mind. Similar, just as the chariot is not an entity contained in the parts of the chariot. That's five. Um, then the sixth one is the chariot is not a collection of its parts. If you take the parts and give a set, is it a chariot? No. Similarly, body, the self is certainly not a collection of body and mind. If you take a lot of organs and thoughts and feelings and emotions and say, this is the set, is this the self? No. Nobody agrees. Even the dualistic schools will not agree to such a thing. The last one, the seventh one. Look, I am saying, you are just trying to confuse me. Chariot is when you connect the parts together, that shape is called the chariot. The shape of the parts is called the chariot. But which part looks like a chariot? Which part of the chariot has the shape like a chariot? No part. It's only a shape which emerges when you arrange them in a particular way. That shape does not belong to the parts. Similarly, you can't say that the self is the form which is generated by the arrangement of the parts of the body. Clearly the form belongs only to the body. Forget the mind. Mind is also not involved in the physical form. And that form continues to change. That cannot be the self. Sevenfold reasoning. Sevenfold reasoning. There is no Atma. The body and mind are not the Atma. There is no Atma apart from body and mind, and so on. The sevenfold reasoning, Chandrakirti, is called Chandrakirti's chariot. Notice one thing is missing in this chariot. If you look at the Kathopanishad chariot, there is the same chariot, but the passenger is there. In Chandrakirti's chariot, there's no passenger. Self-driving car. <laughs> Google car. Anyway. So this was the tremendous challenge thrown by the Buddhists. Where is your precious self? Where is your Atma? Where is your God? Thousand year fight. If you think arguments in Vedanta are subtle and sophisticated, they are childish compared to what went on between the Buddhists and the dualists. Between the... Uh, between on the Buddhist schools on one side, the Sautrantika, Vaibhashika, uh, Yogachara, Vigyanavada, the Shunyavada, Madhyamaka schools. And later on this was all transmitted to Tibet. 
when the, finally the Nalanda University was destroyed by invaders and Buddhism was sort of reabsorbed back into Hinduism and disappeared from India. But the essential teachings they had already spread to other parts of Asia, but these, the deep philosophy was transmitted to Tibet. And I learned recently how much of it has been transmitted to China. Very sophisticated Chinese Buddhism is there. All these things in China, in Chinese language. And Tibetans developed them further for 1,000 years more. Um, great philosophers whom I had never heard of until I studied them last few months. Um, Songkhapa, Mabja, and there's so many others. Uh, there's one philosopher called Songkhapa who's regarded like the Shankara of, of Tibet, and, uh, uh, of that category, of that level. So this was the Buddhist uh, assault. Philosophy developed, but then what, what is the truth then? Then comes the non-dualist. Swami so Vivekananda says, the non-dualists come and say, Advaitins, they come and say, the dualists are not wrong. There is a self. But it's difficult to appreciate. Why? So Vivekananda says, see, imagine, um, see, most of us, we experience a world of change. This one, our lives. And a changing body and a changing mind. There are very few people who have experienced the calm ocean which lies beyond. It can be experienced. Yogis have experienced it. But that's not the common property of everybody. That's why Buddhism has a peculiar hold. It immediately appeals to us because it seems to be talking about our day-to-day -day experience. That's it. You don't have to... What the dualistic school said that that reality, you have to take it on faith until you experience it. Whether you call it God or soul, you have to take it on faith. But that does not appeal so much, especially in today's age, when it's, it's an age of reason and, uh, and logic and science. It's Buddhism. In the West, you will see it's especially America, uh, Buddhism is very, very popular. Any thoughtful person who is interested in spirituality uh, of, uh, almost always at least spends some time as a Buddhist. I met uh, this gentleman in Hollywood. He used to come to the Vedanta Society, then he became a Buddhist, and then 20 years later he's back. And uh, he said, see, the reason I'm back to Vedanta is this. In Buddhism is perfect, I, I really like it. But I missed God. <laughs> I missed the old Karmajan. <laughs> so Vedanta, there's uh, one devotee, Peter Kowalski. He was interviewed once in Hollywood. What is this Vedanta you go to? What's it? He said, think of Buddhism plus God. <laughs> Which is a nice way of putting it. <laughs> so the non-dualist says, the dualist is right. There is a soul. I can see some people going, Phew, thank God. <laughs> there is a soul. There is uh, that ultimate unchanging reality beyond, behind all the change. But he says, the Buddhist is also right. How? It is, it is not true that there is a self or a soul apart from this. That there is this model, body, mind and self. No. It's not true that there is a snake apart from the rope. The classic snake and rope example. It's not true that there is a snake apart from the rope. That which is the rope is mistaken as the snake. And this, the rope is the truth about the snake. The snake is experienced. It may be false, but it, it's still experienced. Similarly, what we experience is a mass of change, of karma, of birth and rebirth, of suffering and evil. That is the appearance which, when investigated, shows the reality of, of the self, the, of the calm ocean behind. It's not that this unchanging self and a changing world are different entities. It's not that the unchanging self and the changing body and mind are different entities. It's the same thing. One only appears as many. Swami Vivekananda says, um, another of his examples, the mass of waves and bubbles and foam in the ocean, thousands upon thousands and arising and disappearing. And yet, when you look at it as water, it's all one reality. Why would you say one reality? Why not? Yes, water is there, but there are also thousands of waves. Not also. Philosophically, one must be exact. If you say also, that means water plus thousands of waves. No, because if you take the water away, the waves do not exist. 
Actually, Swami Vivekananda says this. If you take away the water from the ocean, um, neither the waves will exist, nor the ocean will exist. So in this ocean example, the waves are us individual beings, what we consider ourselves to be now. The entire ocean is God, Ishwara. But beyond the individual beings and beyond God, underneath all of them, their reality, their inner reality, their intrinsic reality is one substance called water. One substance called water. From the perspective of water, non-dual. Non-dual means not to. No wave is a second independent reality apart from water. No individual is a second ind independent reality apart from Atman. Um, even God is not a second independent reality apart from the Atman. There is one unit, he uses this term, one unit existence. The Sanskrit for that is Sat, one being, one isness, which is also consciousness. And that appears as many. Why does one appear? How do you explain, if it's non-dual, how do you explain variety? How do you explain change? How do you explain all this good and evil? So the Advaitins have a very nice word for that. They call it Maya. What is Maya? Maya is that which makes the one non-dual reality appear as many. What's it made of? It's made of name and form. What makes the difference between one wave and the other wave? Between a wave and a bubble and a little bit of foam? It's a name, wave. And it's a form and an activity which we call wave. But none of it is possible without the water. Will the name and the, and the activity of the wave remain if you take the water away? Nothing will remain. It will just disappear. So it is the water alone which appears as this. And this is Maya. Swami Vivekananda gives another example. One sun reflected in millions of globules of water appears as millions of suns. But it's still that one sun. The globules of water are like name and form. He says one existence reflected in millions of globules of name and form appears as millions of beings. How can existence be reflected? It just means that existence is borrowed. How can existence be borrowed? It's nothing very complicated. It just in the sense that the wave borrows its existence from the water. Without water, no existence of wave. Without that one unit existence, Sat, Being or Brahman, we do not have our existence. All of us are that one reality. We are one as Brahman. I said, wait a minute, but you introduced Maya. Sat, Brahman, existence are one thing I understand. Atma, Sat, Brahman, existence, fine. But you introduced Maya. So there are two things. And Swami Vivekananda says, Maya does not exist by itself. It's not a second existence apart from, um, the, uh, from, from Brahman. Just as the name and form of the wave are not a second existence apart from water. It's not that there is water. And there's something called name and form and you take them and put it here and you get a wave. No. Because if you take name and form away from water, nothing. They disappear. So maya does not exist by itself. It's not a second independent existence. Therefore you cannot charge uh, us with duality. That the two things. Brahman plus maya. No. It has no existence of its own. It's an appearance. Maya is also an appearance. And all the products of maya are an appearance. The world and action and birth and rebirth and individual beings, all an appearance. Um, but it's not that it does not exist. Swami Vivekananda is clear on this point. It's not that Maya does not exist. Why? Seeing, this is his exact words, seeing that it makes all this difference. All of our life is possible because of Maya. Uh, all happiness and misery and all Vedanta is possible because of Maya and all of this is possible because of Maya only. So because it makes all this difference, between, because we experience the reality as, as in this way, therefore we cannot say Maya does not exist. We cannot say Maya does exist also in the same way as Brahman. So this is called in Sanskrit Anirvachanya, Sad Asad Bhyam Anirvachanya. What does it mean? Inexpressible as existing or as non-existing. This curious in-between twilight state. Uh, this is Maya. I was reading uh, some reminiscences, beautiful reminiscences written by Swami Chetanananda Ji. 
uh, about Swami uh, Jagadananda. He was a disciple of the Holy Mother. He was the first one to translate the great master into English, Lila Prashango into English, Swami Jagadananda. So he says in one place, he was a great non-dualist. He says, you know, the secret of non-dualism is this. Maya, cause and effect, appearance, multiplicity, all of these are just explanation. They are stories we tell the ignorant, the seeker, so that you have something to hold on to until you realize Brahman. Once you realize Brahman, all these are to be dispensed with. There is no cause, there is no effect. What is cause in Advaita Vedanta? Brahman plus Maya is defined as Ishwara. Ishwara is God. So God is Brahman plus Maya. The pure being with the power of Maya is the cause. Cause of what? Cause of this universe. All this material universe, all living beings, the jiva, all of us. Cause and effect. Cause is Ishwara, effect is this universe. Underneath both is Brahman, the absolute. But the reality is neither cause nor effect are real. Uh, it is just an explanatory mecha mechanism. Don't take it too seriously. Take only one thing seriously. That is Brahman. Then what becomes of all of this? You explained the dualist talked about. Uh, birth and death and karma and heaven. Going to Brahma Loka and Pitri Loka. The different worlds. Being born as animals and birds and human beings. And going life after life. All fairy tales. So Vivekananda says, they are all children's tales that we tell each other. But he says, be very careful. The modern materialist will say, but that's what we are saying. All those heaven, hell, God, all that is fantasy. It's just superstition. It's just fairy tales. Vivekananda says, that's one big mistake that the moderns make. We consider all of this to be mythology except this life. What Advaita Vedanta is saying is that this life too is a mythology. All of it is mythology. He says, it is all you, my Lord, or all I. But this division between I and you, this duality is Maya. All that ap appears is I, the self. Or, if, you, if that's too much, then all that appears is you, my Lord. That also is possible. That's the devotee's attitude. Both are spiritual attitudes. But I and you, this separation, this is samsara. We are one with the God of the universe, Swami Vivekananda says. Aham Brahmasmi. This is the solution of the non-dualist. Then the question arises, all that's good to say. How can God commit sins? How can God do bad things? There's so much evil. The problem of evil and sin comes up. Swami Vivekananda is especially hard on this. He says, um, we see sin only when there's sin within us. And then he gives this cute example of the baby who sit in a room and there's a bag of gold there and a thief, a robber comes and steals the bag of gold. But for the baby, it's neither gold nor a robber. Yeah. There is nothing particularly precious about the gold. There is nothing sinful about that person who's called a robber. No, there is no sin in the heart of the baby because of innocence, not because of Vedanta. <laughs> and there is no sin in the heart of the enlightened person. Vivekananda says, that it is a sin to call man a sinner. He says there that that man alone is a sinner who sees sin in others. You can imagine the devastating impact it would have had in 19th century America at that time. People were stunned, but it gave them a new way of looking at religion and spirituality. Uh, so, um, what happens to these heavens and hells? He says these are like dreams or hallucinations we see. When the mind is colored by wickedness, this reality itself appears to be hell. When the mind is colored by goodness, this reality itself appears to be Pitri Loka or Brahma Loka, the, um, the world of Brahman or the world of the ancestors. And then when this mind becomes enlightened, it is all Brahman. God alone exists. So this is the idea of Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta, what it does is divides into two levels. Ultimate truth, Paramarthika, where Brahman alone exists, and a Vavaharika, transactional level of truth, where all this, where even dualism is accepted as true. So, this is the great um, conclusion. Um, what, what is the result of this knowledge? 
What is the result of this knowledge? Swami Vivekananda says that the result is all fear will go away. Whom to be afraid of? Who can harm me? I am immortal. Who can harm me? There is no second being apart from me. Um, what, can, what do I need in this world? All desire will disappear for, this, for things of the world. Because I am all beings. All beings are appearances in me. All heavens and hells will cease. All desire will cease. All action prompted by desire will cease. And therefore, the results of actions also will cease. With, with the disappearance of karma, life and death also disappear. And one radiant unity alone exists. That one radiant unity, that Brahman, is the real man, the real person. Apparent and real. So Swami Vivekananda says the reality is that. So that is the reality spoken of by Advaita Vedanta. Um, I remember there was this great philosopher in late 19th, early 20th century in, in Cambridge, um, F.H. Bradley. So there was a, a period of idealism in British philosophy up to the late 19th century, early 20th century, before it was replaced by positivism and other things. So Bradley was one of the elder contemporaries of Moore and Russell. And he wrote this book, a classic, called Appearance and Reality, which is very Vedantic. And we had it in our library. I remember when I was a novice about 20, 20 years ago in the Belurmat library, an old copy with little holes made by insects. But when I started reading it, I found it's amazing. Uh, it just, the, it has two parts, appearance and reality. So first part is appearance. And the way he argues to show that what we experience in the world, it must be an appearance. It can't be real in itself. It's so Vedantic. And I remember we used to have this professor who would come and teach us, Nirod Varan Chakravarti, who's a retired professor of philosophy in, I think, uh, Jadapur University. He was a disciple of Swami Abhedananda. So wonderful, though. very good teacher, very short man, big eyes, booming voice, um, old gentleman. He would come. And I asked him, sir, can you teach us, can you teach me this book, Appearance and Reality? The old man was so delighted. He said, Maharaj, I was not yet a monk, Brahmachari. He said, Maharaj, you want to read this? Nobody reads, wants to read these books today. Nobody wants to read these things today. I will certainly teach you. And the old man, he gave up something very, very, very valuable for Indians, the afternoon siesta. He used to come to our monastery and he would rest in the afternoon and then afterwards he would give, teach us philosophy. So he gave up that siesta. He said, if you are willing to give it up, I'm also willing to give it up. And he would teach me Bradley. So in, in the monastery on the bank of the Ganga, we are studying this late 19th century British philosopher. Um, I got only up to appearance. I didn't get to the reality part. <laughs> but this is the reality according to Vivekananda. It was just a couple of months back. It was amazing. At, the, at a philosophy class on Buddhism at Harvard in the philosophy department there, uh, divinity school there. So Professor Garfield is talking about um, the Shunyavada Buddhism. He said, have any of you heard about Bradley? And there's all these graduate students and PhD candidates sitting there all scratching their heads. It's an, it's an early English philosopher, um, uh, early 20th century English philosopher, F.H. Bradley, appearance in reality. Anybody read it? So I said, yes. <laughs> so this is weird orange guy who's the only one who's read, read, read it. And the professor was so happy. He said, you should all read it. This is, uh, uh, you can see the similarities in thought there. This is the reality according to Advaita Vedanta. This one radiant unity which exists everywhere. Even now, we just don't see it. Now Vivekananda says, very quickly, Vivekananda says, what next? Two questions arise. One question is, can we experience this? By the way, he gives other nice examples in between. So many examples and metaphors and similes. He says, all this change, this change is like um, you're reading a book. Page after page of the book of life turns and chapter after chapter turns. But you are not changing. You are, you're the same person who's reading. It's the book which is changing. Then he gives an example of the train, railway. And he's, he traveled across this country by train. So he says, the fields, they seem to be moving, but it's actually it's a train which is moving, not the fields. And one more, the sun and the earth. So when you stand and look, it seems the sun is rising and uh, circling across the earth and, and setting in the west, but it is the earth's motion, which is, we 
falsely ascribed to the sun. Um, but the fact is, if we knew, we would know that it's not the uh, sun which is moving, but it's the earth which is moving. Subtle point here which I like very much. This great philosopher Wittgenstein, one day, he was walking outside the class, after the class in Cambridge, and this lady who has written this, she was walking with him, and he looked at up at the sun and he said, why did the ancients think that the sun moved you know, from east to west? It doesn't move, it's the earth which is rotating. Why did the ancients think that? And the lady said, but professor, that's what it looks like. That's why they thought that it looks like that. Then he said, ah, but if it did not, what would it look like? But if it was the other way around, if the earth were moving and not the sun, what would it look like? It would look exactly the same. Huh. Why is this important? If it is true that you are Brahman, immortal, one existence, consciousness, bliss, what would the world look like? Like this? Yes. You say, no, no, this, is, this world is real, I am separate, all of this is there. Uh, why? It looks like that. If you are Brahman and world is appearing because of Maya, what would it look like? Like this. <laughs> that is one of the most powerful arguments in favor of uh, Advaita Vedanta. It does not... See, often relig religion and science are at loggerheads. Religion says, my book says this. Science says, we have discovered things which are, makes your book wrong. And then religion feels sort of duty bound, tradition bound, or bound just by fear and superstition to hold on to what I have read in my book. The thing we are afraid of is, if I admit one thing is wrong in the book, the whole thing might be wrong. Who knows? So I'm unable to let go of even one little superstition in my book in terror of what might happen. But science has proven it to be wrong. Advaita Vedanta is not like that. It's based on your experience and understanding. This experience and the understanding provided by um, the, the texts. You see it in an entirely new paradigm. By the way, let me introduce one more little insight I got from some of the readings there at Harvard. Realization. You might not think that in Harvard University professors are sitting and talking about enlightenment, but they are actually. So here was one interesting discussion. Enlightenment. Of course, the discussion was in the Buddhist context. That was the course. But it equally applies to Advaita Vedanta. What is enlightenment? How do we understand enlightenment? Two models. One is called the epistemic shift model. Another one is called the uh, ethical manifestation model. What does it mean? Epistemic shift means, I was thinking of myself as this little creature, body and mind, birth and death, pleasure and pain and suffering, struggling through life. This is one idea of myself, my, my understanding. Now it shifts. I am that one unchanging light, this awareness, this existence consciousness, which is clear to me now. Suppose the shift happens. This is enlightenment. So this is one kind of enlightenment. This is one way of looking at enlightenment. An epistemic shift. Epistemic means knowledge. A change in our paradigm about ourselves. What we thought about ourselves has undergone a... Uh, a revolutionary shift, sudden shift, and permanent. It comes in a flash, but it remains stable. Just like our idea of ourselves right now is stable. I am a body, mind, stable. But once the shift happens, that also is stable. That I am this witness consciousness, this awareness, this existence consciousness place. This is one way of understanding enlightenment. Epistemic shift model. The second way of understanding enlightenment is Again, it was in the Buddhist context. This idea of the Buddha nature, which is within, within all of us, manifesting that. Love and unselfishness and overcoming desire and serenity and peace and joy. Um, compassion for all beings. What we would regard a great saint as having. The manifestation of those qualities, divine qualities in life. This is called the ethical manifestation model. Now what Vivekananda is saying, so up to this much was the paper which we discussed. But Vivekananda is saying both of these are enlightenment. His beautiful definition, religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us. Now look at that, we, we memorize this, it's a very simple definition. How profound it is. Mm. It, 
there is an ethic, uh, epistemic shift. I am Brahman. Not I am body mind. I am Brahman. Not I am mortal. I am immortal. Not I am flesh and blood. I am awareness. Not I am changing moment to moment. I am the unchangeable reality. Not I am going around in the world with a begging bowl. Give me happiness. Give me a little praise. Give me a little fulfillment. No. I am the source of all peace and fulfillment. It all, it's mine. It's coming back from, to me from the world. So that's the epistemic shift. And the other side, Swami Vivekananda says, manifestation. It must be reflected in my thought, in my words, in my deeds. Swami Vivekananda says, for such a person, such a person, the thoughts, the thoughts will be automatically good. The words of such a person will be blessings. The actions of such a person will be blessings. In fact, this person will be a living blessing for, for everybody around. This is, the, this is the ethical manifestation model. So both, this is, this is enlightenment. I know I am Brahman and also able to manifest it in my life. So what a very, very beautiful insight. This is why Vivekananda asks, so what will happen after this? Question. We are all eager. To, oh, now I've understood. Uh, Brahma, Jnana, enlightenment, God realization. And next, next, what will happen next? <laughs> Far ahead, but anyway, what will happen next? One of the professors used to ask this question. So Vivekananda says there are two great questions. One is, is it practical? Is it possible to realize this? Second, what will happen after this? So, very quickly, um, one of the professors asked this question. He's fond of asking this question at, uh, at Harvard. How many people get enlightenment? Very few. So, is it worth pursuing? How many? Even optimistic figure. How many will get enlightenment? Why should we pursue this very rare case? So he asked me. I gave him two answers. And then he gave me a beautiful third answer. So I'll give you all three. The first answer which I give, usually give is that all of us will get enlightenment. Only it may take many lifetimes. Since you are Brahman, According to Advaita Vedanta, what can stop you? It is your greatest birthright. It is very natural that you will, uh, one day or the other, we will all realize our real nature, that we are one with God. That all of this is the manifestation of Brahman. It is Brahman. We will realize it. So that's one. We all will get enlightenment, not, not one. But who knows? Sri Ramakrishna used to say in Banaras, in, in Kashi, which is the place of Annapurna, Divine Motherhood gives food. All will be fed. Nobody will go hungry. <coughs> Nobody will go hungry. But some get food in the morning, some in the afternoon. Don't worry, everybody will get food in the <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but some will get food in the afternoon. Some will have to wait till sunset, uh, till evening. But they will all get food. What does it mean? All will get liberation. Some here itself. Some at the end of their lives, some maybe next life. Some at the end of the universe, at the end of the cosmic cycle. That's evening. <laughs> That's God's evening. <laughs> All the ones who are remaining, alright, free. On sale now, before, every, before I shut down the shop for this time. So, that's one answer. The second answer I gave was, once you have understood what spiritual life is, what else will you do? What else will you do except pursue enlightenment? Maybe you will not get enlightenment. What, what else will you do except pursue this? What else is worthwhile? Everything else in life will go on, but this will become your central pursuit. What else is worth doing? Then he said, those are good answers, Swami, but they are sort of ultimate, abstract, philosophical answers. Let me give you a practical answer. Why one should pursue enlightenment? He said, what is that? He said, once you start, whether you get enlightenment or not, day to day, the benefits that flow, the peace and the joy and the sense of security and strength, sense of protection, it slowly becomes the most valuable thing in your life. Whether enlightenment is there or not, we don't know, but you can never let go of it anymore. I like that answer. That's a very practical answer. And for most people, that's, that's how we are continuing actually. So, what happens? Is it practical? Yes. Swami Vivekananda said, in fact in that lecture he said, by the touch of such persons, such extraordinary persons exist who have realized it. 
And in fact, I met one such person and by his touch my entire life was transformed. I will tell you about him next Sunday, he said in that talk. Which means he must have talked about Sri Ramakrishna in the next Sunday lecture, he says. I will tell you about him next, I will speak about him next Sunday, he says. Um, now, what will happen after enlightenment? Swami Vivekananda gives two examples. I'll give those and I will stop there. The two examples are, one, the example of two wheels which are going and connected by a pole. They're rolling along. And you take an axe and cut the pole. And one wheel stops, the other goes on rolling for a while and then falls. Similarly, one of the wheels is the real self, pure consciousness. And the other one is the apparent self. The ego connected with body and mind. The one which is changing all the time. The one which we think we are. One is the real one we think we are, the, the real thing which we are, Brahman. The other one is the jiva, the apparent self. And they are connected. How? By no connection at all. The only connection is ignorance. When you cut, when you cut the pole which connects, which is no pole at all, it's just ignorance. In Hindi they say, Beukufi matra hai. It's only foolishness which connects the two. Ignorance shows you, I have never been that other wheel. I am Brahman. Once you do that, it's cut. But the other wheel will not stop. It will go on. The force of karma is upon it. It will roll a little more and then come to a stop. Same example I found in Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism. Very interesting. The example of the, they call it the example of the strong potter. So the potter makes a pot and the potter's wheel is there. So a strong potter gives a very strong, uh, you know, like uh, push to it. Then he gets up and goes. The wheel will not stop immediately. Two or three times it will go around and then fall. Similarly, body mind will continue because of past karma. And this body mind continuing because of past karma, this is called Jivan Mukti. Enlightened while living. And Swami Vivekananda says, this is the goal of Vedanta. The goal of Vedanta is not to become Brahman. You are Brahman already. The goal of Vedanta is to realize that you are Brahman and continue in this way, this way as long as it will continue. These are the enlightened beings of this world. You're still continuing in this body and mind, but you know that you are not it. You are Brahman. And as long as this body and mind lasts, it is a great blessing to everybody in this world. The second example he gives of, is of the Miraj. He says, when I was traveling in the western part of India, the deserts of Rajputana, I would see these beautiful lakes in the distance. One day I was thirsty and I went up to one of those lakes and I saw it was just, it was just shimmering air. There is no water there at all. And I realized, oh, this is the mirage which I have read about. Then I started walking again and the mirage came back. But now I know it's a mirage. And he says that, similarly, after enlightenment, the world will come back. There will be the world appearance, body appearance, thoughts will be there. Everything will come back as it is. But, he says, weakened. The poison will be gone from it. Karma, the, the chains of karma will be much weaker. They cannot bind you anymore. Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of a rope which is burnt and yet retains its shape. It looks like a black uh, chain of, um, you know, it's, it's just ash, but it looks like a rope. He says it's, it's, it cannot bind anybody. In fact, if you blow on it, it will fly away into ashes. Similarly, body, mind, ego, all will appear, but it cannot do anything to you anymore. So, um, that is living while f f uh, free. This mirage example, this was beautiful, beautifully worked out mirage example in detail was given by Professor Garfield in one of his uh, articles, which I liked very much. So I told him in the class that I'm going to steal this. And he said, examples are meant to be stolen, so good luck to you. <laughs> so I'm going to use it now. If he's watching, thank you very much. He says, driving in the desert, say in uh, Arizona, if you're d driving there, or, or um, um, where is the desert? Arizona and Nevada. Now there are these mirages. There are different kinds of drivers. One is the, the new driver and who does not understand it. So he is driving and what does he see? Water. Oh, there's water there in the road, shimmering there. And it has to be explained to him that it's not water, it looks like that, it's a, it's a mirage. We, the ignorant people, are like that. 
we think here is the world here. It's like a mirage, but it's actually, we think, take it to be the real. There's a second type of driver who is the one who wears polarized. This is his addition to the uh, example. He says he wears polarized glasses. Now, they didn't have polarized glasses in Buddha's time or Shankara's time. So he wears polarized glasses. In fact, it seems if you wear those glasses, you cannot see the illusion also. The polarized glasses are there. Uh, you can see everything, but you will not see the illusion. The mirage you will not see. So you'll see neither water nor mirage, nothing. He just says, what? What are you talking about? Nothing. That is like the yogi who is in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. What world? Body, mind, world, nothing is there. <laughs> so you're Im immersed in Samadhi, world disappears. Nothing is seen. You remain as the Atman. That's the yogic approach. Second. Third one is the person who has read about a mirage. Who has understood. Driving along, he sees water. Oh, water. Then he remembers. No, no, no. Mirage. This is how it's happening. It looks like water. He thought it was water. And now it still looks like water, but he knows the theory behind it. Who is that? Professor. <laughs> who has read about it. And who has understood it. That it is Brahman. Because of name and form, it all appears as good and bad human beings and all of these. Appearing like that, affecting me, I know the theory. But practically it's not working. It still looks like that. looks like a real world for me. Not only world looks real, body looks real and feels real to me. Mind feels real to me. Desires and frustrations and unhappiness. I know these are all appearances in, in one radiant awareness. But still feels real and hurts. I know the theory, but it looks like this. He says, this is the level of the professor. Of the seeker, we are understanding all of this, but we, when we come into contact with life, when we see the thing, we don't see mirage, we say water. And then we remember and understand the theory, mirage. Still helpful, good. We now begin to understand what it is. And the last one is the enlightened being, who sees, who does not even see the water. He sees, but he sees mirage. It is so practiced, so natural, he sees that here is an appearance. Here is Maya doing its job. Yeah. That sadhu who came to Dakshineshwar and who would sit in his room and meditate all day long. Once in a while he would come out and clap and dance with joy. Wah, kya Maya, what Maya this is. The sky and the Ganga and the river and the, and the, and the temple. It's all Brahman, but it's appearing like this. Wonderful Maya, wonderful. Expert. Expert driver. He does not say, here is the river, but it's actually name and form river. Really it is. <laughs> Let me read. Chapter this one, it says, okay, this one is like this. No. For him, automatically, here is Brahman. But it appears like a river. What Maya? How beautiful, wonderful. And they would go back to his room and meditate again. So that is the level of the expert driver. We are now at the level, most of us, we are at the level of the the driver who has read the book about the mirage. Now we are driving but we are experiencing it again and again getting problems. But afterwards, enlightenment is, we will still see the same thing but we know it to, to be an appearance and maya. What happens then? What good is it? Swami Vivekananda gives another of his beautiful examples. What good is it if you ask? He says, first of all, why should it be any good? Truth is good for its own sake. We should know the truth for its own sake. He gives the example of a baby. If you, the, for the baby, the candies are the most important thing, a little child. And if you teach the baby about electricity, which was latest technology at that time, because Swami Vivekananda had uh, met um, Tesla. I think he had met Edison too, but I'm not sure. Swami Abhidananda had met Edison. Edison took him to, to his uh, lab, there's a uh, description. Edison gave him one of the first gramophones too, which is there in Calcutta, in the monastery now. <laughs> Some say it still plays. So... He had, he had learned about electricity, so he would use that ex latest example. Nowadays, no, but no doubt he would talk about iPhones and um, all these things today <laughs> if he had used that example. He says, if we try to explain about electricity to a child, the child will say, what good is it? Will it give me a candy? <laughs> we are like that. We are like that. I have no time to dilate upon this. But think about it. When I... I, I notice it. I mentioned it at the divinity school also. Here we are studying religion. But the entirety is, uh, is what good will religion do to us? 
Will it solve, um, how to use religion to solve global warming? How to use religion, redefine religion to fit with LGBTQ? How to use religion to, um, you know, implement it in politics stuff, the my liking? All these are, will it give me candy? If it doesn't, it's no good. I'm not saying I'm, ag uh, I'm against this. This has to be done. Religion has to be useful to us in our society, in our day and, ti and, uh, and uh, our time. What is our problem? It, religion should be able to help us to solve it, no doubt. But this is the secondary, the byproduct, the side benefits. The real benefit is what Buddha said, solving suffering at the deepest possible level. So Swami Vivekananda says, it does good. It does the greatest good. This is love. The highest of things, he says, he alone loves who sees God in all beings. That person alone loves who sees God in friend and foe. The husband loves the wife the more by seeing God in the wife. The wife loves the husband more by seeing God in the husband. The parents love, this is Swami Vivekananda's words, parents love the children the more seeing God in the children. The people love a holy person more by seeing God in the holy person. And the same per people love uh, the unholy person also, seeing God in the, say, in the unholy person. The person loves, you will love your friend more by knowing that that friend is nothing other than God. And you will love your greatest enemy too by knowing that that enemy is nothing other than God. This is the benefit. He says, if even a small fraction of humanity were to realize some of these truths, then this earth itself would be transformed into heaven. You're talking about what benefit will it give to society? Yes. Very uh, inspiring, soaring words. He says, then what will society be like? Then gods will love gods. Gods will be playing with gods. Gods will be working with gods. It transforms the human into divine. This will be the benefit of this, this great philosophy. Hitherto, this philosophy, Vivekananda says, was restricted to a very few, even in the land of its birth. But now the time has come to broadcast it across uh, the world. And nowadays he would be very happy with YouTube and all of this. <laughs> the day will come, I pray to the Lord that the day will come when this great truth will become the common property of humanity and the very air of our societies will be surcharged with that thou art, Tattvamasi, Tattvamasi. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Sri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu.